when I'm feeling down about the injustice in the world, The Fellowship of the Ring becomes really about the long and torturous journey to escape the hegemony of ideology. When I'm struggling against self-consciousness to put words on paper, Steve Reich's Piano Counterpoint becomes really about the feverish, self-conscious anxiety of writer's block. When I'm feeling hopeless about the possibility of communication, Ravuni Kenshin becomes about how even though it's a painful, arduous, even dangerous process, there's always hope of changing intransigent minds. What? I said hope. I wasn't finished speaking. Let's face it, in times like these, it's easy to get down or anxious or even upset. And for good reason, there's a lot in the world to be down or anxious or even upset about. And you know, when we're down, a lot of us reach for the fictive. Fiction, whether it's a book or a movie or a TV show or a piece of music or a soundtrack for a made-for-TV movie based on a book, it's there for us. But how? What's going on when we appropriate fiction therapeutically? Essentially, I'd like to argue that therapeutic reading amounts to a kind of creative misreading, a semiosis of the self. You probably have no idea what I just said, but that's okay. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So to think about this, I wanted to go beyond my own experience. So I asked a few friends on Twitter uh, about the ways that they read, watch, or listen to stuff when they're feeling down, anxious, upset, etc. And a couple trends came out of that that seems to gel pretty nicely with my own experience. At Alex Bohr described how binging Netflix on the sofa sort of compounds the problem for her. It numbs her in the moment, but is ultimately unsatisfying. No peace, no healing, no silence, no rest, she says. At John L.B. agreed, he says doing the escapist thing doesn't really help him feel better. Summing up this approach, at Jack Spillar says that for him, there are certain fictions that are sort of like comfort food. They're familiar, pregnant with memories, but he says comfort fictions are more an overt distraction from negative emotions. On the flip side, everyone seemed to agree that there is a way to reach for fiction in the tough times without being necessarily escapist about it. At Jack Spillar put this really well in terms of music. He says, for music, I tend to harmonize with mood. So melancholic stuff with soothing sonic qualities if I'm anxious, sad, or upset. Music, while it can still be a familiar and therefore comfortable thing, it can also serve as an attempt to harmonize with emotions, to let them run their course, as he puts it. So from these responses, it seems to me that when it comes to fiction plus downness, there are at least a couple moves one might make. One is to escape the feelings you have, to distract yourself with fiction, to distance yourself from general downness. This method is one of deferral, since it kind of temporarily suppresses or delays having to deal. And the other is to engage with those feelings, to become conscious of and to accept how you feel and try to find fiction that harmonizes with it until it runs its course. Under certain circumstances, this method seems to me more akin to something like therapy. Quick disclaimer, I am not a therapist and I don't necessarily want to make a value judgment between these two approaches, which after all are speculative for the purposes of me talking about literary theory. And my analysis may not hold true for those who struggle with depression or mental illness or very many people at all. So when faced with the choice we've sort of set up here, why would anyone want to deepen their engagement with emotions like anxiety and sadness and upset? That seems kind of weird, right? Okay, let's talk about catharsis. We get the Greek word catharsis from the philosopher Aristotle's book on poetics, in which he theorizes the function of, among other things, comedy and tragedy. Catharsis is, according to Aristotle, part of the function of tragedy, which is a representation of a serious, complete action, i.e. narrative, accomplishing, by means of pity and terror, the catharsis of such emotions. Aristotle is trying to argue that tragic fiction, which conventionally culminates in some catastrophe, foregrounding suffering, defeat, even death, at least in Greek drama, is not necessarily bad for the soul. On the contrary, by this model, engaging in tragic fiction brings the audience to a place of exaltation or relief through a kind of sublimation, a redirection of raw emotion into something socially acceptable or safe. In another text, Aristotle associates catharsis with harmless delight and a pleasant feeling of relief. The meaning of catharsis is actually pretty unclear though, and presents some problems that we'll discuss later. So for our purposes, catharsis has to do with the positive engagement with serious emotional content through fiction. But I think there is a difference between attending a play in Athens with half the city every once in a while and me pulling up Spotify or Netflix in the moment of my sadness or upset. The common denominator in the Twitter responses to my question 
seems to be the idea of self-selection. For all intents and purposes, I can choose whatever piece of media I want whenever I want. And when I do, I'm also free to choose media into which I can easily insert myself, like I was demonstrating in the opening. And that seems to me less like spectating and more like speech. Some mutation Roman Jakobsen demonstrates in his essay two aspects of language and two types of aphasic disturbances that discourse occurs in two kinds of operations akin to metaphor on the one hand and metonymy on the other. Metaphor has to do with semantic similarity. A metaphor substitutes for something else by virtue of meaning something similar or opposite. Metonymy has to do with semantic contiguity. A metonym stands in relation to something else by association or predication. This scheme helps to explain how discourse works when we speak or write. In the moment of an utterance, I select signs from a sort of catalog of options that mean similar things. This happens in a vertical axis associated with metaphor. I also combine my selections beside each other in ways that create meaning in strings of contiguity, as in metonymy. This is how I operate language when I speak or write in order to encode meaning. Now, Aristotle might have found this explanation familiar. In another one of his treatises, he talks about signification in terms of selecting nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc., that when combined, produce meaning. Philosopher Paul Ricoeur sums this up in one of his books, explaining that for Aristotle, discourse functions in this way to say something of something. The Greek word for this process is hermeneia, from which we get the word hermeneutic, and which translates to interpretation. Whereas for us, interpretation has to do with taking in and dealing with significations out in the world. The ancient Greek concept designates the act of signification itself. Following Aristotle's logic to conclusion, Ricoeur states that to say something of something is, in the complete and strong sense of the term hermeneia, to interpret. To me, this describes what's going on when I'm feeling down and reach for the fictive. The process of selecting musical, textual, or televisual signs that harmonize with or can be read slash misread as being semantically similar in some way to my emotional thoughts in the moment looks a lot to me like the metaphorical operation of language. Of course, having selected them, I then combine them through time with my own emotional moments of sadness, anxiety, or upset they become metonymic to my emotional state. I am saying something of my affective experience, and in so doing, I am also interpreting that experience. I am giving it meaning by what is essentially a therapeutic misreading, a discourse of the self. As cool as this is, it does raise some questions. I said before that the meaning of catharsis is sort of fraught, and I think it provides a helpful lens with which to interrogate the upshot of this kind of therapeutic misreading. Catharsis can be interpreted in different ways. Catharsis can signify purification or cleansing in a religious sense, but what exactly is purified? Are the emotions themselves cleansed, or is it the person who feels them? And so, does catharsis sanction certain emotions, or can it ever challenge what we feel? Catharsis can also signify purgation or discharge as a medical term, applicable to things like sneezing, sweating, excreting something from the body. But is it realistic to expect the psyche to work this way, and does catharsis really rid us of anything? Or, as in yet another meaning of the word, does catharsis serve as a clarifier? Does the relief of catharsis indicate a divestment from, or a repression of our impulses? Furthermore, can catharsis dissuade us from critical reading by how it makes us feel better about the world and our place in it? This really only touches on the issues arising from how we engage with texts affectively, and there's much more to the story. But at the very least, the concepts of catharsis and hermeneia are nice for opening up discussion of the ways that language functions and how we operate language to create meaning for ourselves. That said, having friends along when you're feeling down and reaching for the fictive can make a big difference. Meaning can be made collectively to great effect, and I will say, misreading together can be quite therapeutic.